mean, all of Svalbard is polar bear spot, but I feel like the East Coast is like prime polar bear location. Why do you live there? This is still a question I get daily. And this, my friends, this is why. Nature, raw Arctic wilderness. If you live in a place like Svalbard, an island close to the North Pole, there's a good chance that you have a high appreciation of nature. Because I'm not sure this type of life is enjoyable if you don't. We happily jump on our snowmobiles to drive for two and a half hours, 90 kilometers one way, to have lunch on the east coast of Svalbard. Because that is what life is all about here. Not to see the challenges of the harsh climate as something we are working against, but more as something we get to experience. So today, I'm going to give you one of Svalbard's best experiences, a snowmobile trip. And this one takes us to the other side of the island. Let's go. Christopher is now just checking the snow. So this could be potentially super wet uh, or it could even lead into like water. So he's just gonna check what it's like if it's super, super wet. Mostly because we have our wooden sled, which is not very good <laughs> to drive in any sort of conditions that are not, you know, snowy. We're gonna head over there to that glacier and we're gonna check that out and we're gonna take our binoculars and see if we can see any polar bears out here and see what we head up to. How long did it take us? Two and a half hours? Yeah. It feels like summer, Christopher. It's so warm. Yeah. Look, I don't, it's crazy. Uh, it's a bit warm today. In all of Svalbard is polar bear spot. But I feel like the East Coast is like prime polar bear location. So we're keeping our eyes open. And there are seals on the ice which is pretty much what they do when they're around glaciers. They hunt for seal. <laughs> and here we are. But we, we've looked around with our binoculars. We can't see any. The trip to the East Coast is about 90 kilometers or 56 miles one way. We drove out in somewhat white conditions, which can make navigating a little difficult. If we're going somewhere we have been before, we often know the way by our surroundings, but we also always travel with GPS and have tracks to follow if necessary or if going somewhere new. A GPS is an incredibly important piece of equipment when out snowmobiling here. Not only do we need to know where to go, but we also need to avoid things like glacier cracks and sudden changes in the terrain. I'm flying my drone right now and I have found an obese seal. And I mean, they're supposed to be super fat, but this one, what have you been eating? It's beautiful. It seems very unbothered by everything going on. It's just, you know, living a life. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, moving on, moving on from the seal.
What I love about the East Coast is there are so many huge ice blocks. Just look at how blue this is. Like it's, oh my gosh, that was not solid. This is just so blue. It's pretty wild to be able to walk around in just a jumper in April on the East Coast, which is generally a pretty cold place here. There's not like, there's not any wind. Kolla, det läcker sig så dimma över bergen. Ja, det blir vitt nu. Yeah, there's there's a certain vibe in the air about the weather. It's so calm that it feels like it's the calm before the storm. Do you know what I mean? One of our biggest obstacles when driving, which was a an issue going here, is that it gets so white that you cannot see anything. Everything just melts into one and you can't see, you can't tell any like perception of depth or like height or anything. So you have no idea if you're driving down something or if since you're driving over a glacier, you also can't just wing it because there are crevasses, you know, there's a, a bunch of things. But driving slow and, you know, looking around, but it was a little bit stressful. April is very much a winter month here on Svalbard and actually peak high season. But the weather can vary and within just one week we had snowstorms, rain, sunshine, more snow, more sunshine. It was all over the place. But this time of year is all about heading out on snowmobile. We want to experience as much of the island that we can while it's snow covered. Since it really is our only way of getting around outside the village. Every time we're out and about there's one big question that people ask and it's how do you go to the bathroom? And I actually have to pee right now, so I'm going to show you exactly what you have to do. And it's, it involves taking off a lot of layers. But first I need my shovel. Since other people also, you know, travel around here, you want to keep it nice and clean. Well, not clean, but you want to keep it nice and white. You dig a little hole to do your business in. And if you need to poop, I mean, dig a big hole. <laughs> if you need to pee, just scrape. Scrape off a little snow because it's always nicer. You can't see me, but I'm making a little hole here. Now starts the fun part, taking things off. Okay, so this, and even if it's windy and it's minus 30 degrees, this is what you have to do. There's a lot of layers to take off here. When you gotta go, you gotta go. Okay, now to the fun part. So I'm wearing a onesie, but if you wear a onesie, you have to wear a onesie with a, what we call a, one of these, what's it called? With a butt flap. I have one of those, which means that I don't have to take the rest off. Cause that would be, it would be bad. And always bring your Kleenex and everything, your peed Kleenex on, bring it home and throw it away. Do not put it in nature. Okay, this is actually a little bit cold. And always wear your helmet when peeing. Christopher says always the same. Very important thing. Oh, this is absolutely glorious. What a feeling. I've never felt more free in my entire life. I have now peed. It was successful and it was lovely. There is my tissue. I'm just gonna put that in my pan for now. You know, it's fine. Dom, um, this is my avalanche beacon. No, back in my people. Positively lovely. Christopher also peed. He didn't want me to film it. Crazy. If you've been on my channel for a while, you might have noticed that our winters are relatively mild comparing to other locations on the same latitude. And this is due to the Gulf Stream bringing mild water to Spitsbergen's west and north coasts and giving these areas a milder climate with less drift ice. 
The east coast, on the other hand, is not affected by the Gulf Stream to the same extent. The East Spitsbergen Current, in contrast, brings colder water masses with a lot of drift ice from the Arctic Ocean, making the eastern parts of the archipelago a bit colder in climate with much heavier ice conditions. We're gonna eat something now. Easiest to bring when you go on day trips like this is some kind of dry food that you put hot water in. It's so easy and you always have like 5-10 with you, so if you get stuck, then you can eat it like for a few days. Boiled water that we have. And on Svalbard, Real Turmot is the one, uh, it's a Norwegian brand, I think. Yeah, it is. I think they taste quite okay, like when you eat them. Today it's a pasta bolognese or couscous. It's 500 calories. Uh, no, 525 calories in the pasta bolognese. It's 500 grams of food and it is a freeze-dried meal. I prefer this one, because I eat so much of this. <laughs> so vegetarian is the only one I haven't eaten that much of. So now these days I mostly buy vegetarian because I'm a little bit tired of everything. I have to come in here and give a very fun fact about why Christopher is tired of this food. Could it be because you bought pallets of it and you ate this as your only source of energy for maybe three years? I didn't have a kitchen where I stayed, so this he... was the easy way to get food. But I ate out most of the time, so I bought one, not pallet, but one like box with 40, in, uh, yeah, 40 meals. <laughs> so, and it was the same taste, so <laughs> you had for a while. I don't know how much water you're supposed to have in it, but I always make soup of it. So you can drink it directly from the bottle because it's, it's quite salty. So for me, to make a soup of everything, it's perfect. Shoof. <laughs> Step one. Step two. Open. Step three is actually take a knife and cut a hole here so you get it out. Shake and bake. A smart tip to do. Put it in the bag, close it, so you save the, the heat. And now, just let it rest. This is fine dining. Fine dining in the Arctic. <laughs> it is so good. When we say that this is prime polar bear area, we mean it. Christopher, he's like, yeah, I need to just kind of like scan the perimeter because all of these ice blocks, it's so difficult to see if a polar bear is walking around them or, you know, if it's behind one. And we're like, you know, just here, me, me, me. But we did do a good looking around before we stopped here and before we decided to, you know, hang out behind a big glacier block because you never know. But generally the trips that you book to like see Svalbard and everything, the most successful one to run into a polar bear with a good distance is to take a trip to the East Coast. There are no trips that guarantee seeing a polar bear and seeking one out is illegal, which is great. But of course, when you're out and about and you're covering such big distances, the chance of seeing one is a lot bigger. But before like, before driving out on any ice, you kind of check the area because if there's a polar bear there, you don't go. They have farhams rett. They have priority, so to speak. We stay away from them. Woo, I almost fell there. Listen to the silence. Our friend is watching Grim for us because he just had a tooth surgery. But we told him that we were going to be home at 6 p.m. And right now it is 5.30. 
And usually when you tell somebody that you're going to be home a certain time, they kind of, it raises alarm bells if you're not home at that time. But what we bring with when we're out is satellite communication. So Christopher is now going to use his satellite in reach device to send him a text message and say that we are on our way home now. Don't worry. We're fine. We're safe. But we're going to be home a little bit later than what we said. There is no cell service at all around here. So the only way to be able to communicate is to have these in reach or satellite phones. We've made a stop now. Oh, here comes Christopher by this gorgeous piece of ice. Can you tell that I, I love ice? Uh, we have 60 liters of it. gasoline with us. And for a trip like this, we use maybe, could it be between 30 liter ish. So 60 liters for two persons. Stranded, I know how to handle it all on my own. 